va benissimo, siamo in due. <ride> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back uh, to this uh, second session of our international conference on Libertas, uh, uh, Spaces and Practices of Academic Freedom. Welcome also to the new guests uh, who are connecting with us uh, online uh, for a session that is dedicated to European level action to protect academic freedom. Uh, just to provide a bit of the context uh, for those uh, who were not with us this morning and yesterday, we've already been working in a number of sessions, all dedicated to academic freedom and how universities and institutions can promote uh, academic freedom as a principle and, of course, translate the principle into action. And that is why this uh, specific session is so relevant to us. Um, this session is organized uh, jointly by SAR Italy, here represented by myself. Uh, I'm Claudia Padovani from the University of Padova, and together with uh, my colleague Francesca Helm, we co-coordinate the national section of Scholars at Risk, SAR Italy, and we have collaborated with SAR Europe, He's here represented by Denise uh, Roche, um, to discuss and raise awareness uh, on a number of initiatives that have uh, been elaborated over the last few years uh, by European institutions at different levels uh, to engage uh, with academic freedom as a topic and an issue that is also a new challenge for uh, many of our um, universities and for the context uh, in which uh, we are uh, operating. Um, the session sits uh, within a conference uh, uh, that is part of uh, the celebration of 800 years uh, of the University of Padova. And so we spent the whole morning listening to this uh, uh, long history and the trajectory whereby academic freedom has crossed uh, uh, different other topics, uh, including mobility, internationalization, uh, uh, forms of resistance uh, that have been activated and mobilized uh, through the centuries. Uh, and we're now positioning ourselves uh, in contemporary context uh, where, of course, uh, we know the challenges are uh, once again uh, very high. So the session is really dedicated to get a better understanding of what is going on at the European level and how European institutions are responding to some of the challenges, uh, Ukraine conflict being just uh, the latest of these. Uh, uh, so I will uh, uh, give the floor to a number of speakers. Uh, we are really, really pleased uh, and honored to have you with us. So we will hear uh, from uh, uh, Maria Mitic, uh, who is a policy analyst uh, for the Marie Curie unit um, at the European Commission to discuss uh, uh, the vision of her uh, office uh, and department and the approach to promoting academic freedom and supporting scholars and researchers at risk, as well as to give an overview of how Marie Curie current priorities are responding to the pressing crisis affecting researchers. Um, you should be aware of the fact that over these uh, days uh, we're also running a training for uh, displaced scholars. Uh, uh, one of these events uh, will be in the afternoon tomorrow. We will be discussing different European opportunities for funding for research with a specific focus on the program that you're uh, working. So it's very fortunate uh, that you can present and talk about this as an anticipation to the many scholars that are with us uh, here in the room and also connecting from home. Then we will hear uh, from Slaven uh, uh, Mislienčević, policy officer um, at the European Commission. Uh, he's been working to develop also tools, uh, a toolkit to prevent foreign interference um, in university activity. And he will discuss the work of the European Commission also to develop guidelines um, on dealing with foreign interference, uh, um, which is uh, of special interest uh, to us today. And then we will hear from Axel Leisenberg, also policy officer, uh, to comment on academic freedom within the context of international cooperation in the field of higher education, research and innovation, and the extent to which uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has impacted the development of this work under the French presidency of the Council of the EU and the European Research Area Forum's standing subgroup on the global approach. 
So we're taking this uh, from the local context that we discussed this morning to the European and global context. Uh, and we're really uh, pleased to have you with us uh, to uh, share some of the perspective that we're learning from, uh, uh, from European institutions. Uh, um, I will then give the floor to Denise Roche, and she will introduce uh, properly the session. But before we do this, uh, we also have uh, a welcome address uh, by Mr. David Lega, member of the European Parliament from Sweden, who's been very active in advocating for academic freedom and human rights uh, uh, in the European Parliament context. Uh, so we're now sharing the screen to hear this uh, brief uh, announcement. Dear invitees, panelists, and everyone who is attending this important conference on academic freedom that is arranged by Scholars at Risk Europe, I want to primarily extend my regrets that I was not able to attend today when we are sharing best practices on how to protect the academic freedom in Europe and around the world. My name is David Lega. I'm a member of the European Parliament representing Sweden. And as a member of the Subcommittee on Human Rights, I focus on human rights and fundamental freedoms. And furthermore, I am a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and there we focus on the European Union's relations with the rest of the world. And we know that scholars around the world are not only targeted because of the work that they produce, but also because of their status. And an increased risk of being targeted is due to the extensive travel that they do in some cases. Producing work and travel to share findings to enhance our society should not be life-threatening. And today, I want to address a scholar at risk who I have strongly advocated for in the European Parliament, Dr. Ahmad Reza Jalali. Dr. Jalali has been in prison in Iran for more than six years. On the 4th of May, 2022, various media outlets, including Iran's ISNA News Agency, reported that Iranian authorities are taking steps to execute Dr. Jalali by May 21st. And even though the execution has not been carried out yet, there is a grave risk that it can happen any day now. The Iranian regime does not only imprison respected scholars who fight for the freedom of education. They also commit espionage on the European continent, conduct different forms of reprisals through the use of embassies, diplomats and the diaspora, as well as threaten journalists' freedom of expression. Nevertheless, Dr. Jalali's case is imminent. My colleagues and I are advocating for his release and pushing the international community to put more pressure on the Iranian regime to release him so that he can finally rejoin his family in Sweden again. I want to thank you for all the work that you do and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. The unity that we show around the world when we stand together in the fight for Dr. Jalali's and others' freedom is vital in the fight for democracy. Thank you again. what we are expecting to learn and hear from European uh, uh, commissioners, uh, including suggestions on how to better uh, create connections uh, and possibility to cooperate uh, between European institutions, national institutions, uh, and uh, local institutions, uh, meaning our own university. So Denise, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Claudia. And I just
Oh, thank you very much, Claudia. And of course, I'd like to start by also thanking Sar Italy for organising and inviting um, Sar Europe to be a part of today's event and for the University of Padova for hosting. Um, the status of academic freedom is worsening in some parts of Europe and the world. Scholars at Risk's Academic Freedom Monitoring Project has, since 2011, documented 2,850 severe attacks on researchers, students, scholars, and higher education communities, impacting tens of thousands of victims in 122 countries. The 2022 release of the Global Academic Freedom Index surmised that two out of five people around the world live in countries which have experienced a substantial decline of academic freedom in the past 10 years. With the latest report from Freedom House, rather ominously entitled The Global Expansion of Authoritarian Rule, to reflect the fact that we have experienced 16 consecutive years of democratic decline in global freedom meaning that only 20% of the world's population can be considered to live in free countries. We have just heard from MEP David Lega, who spoke passionately about the plight of Dr. Edmund Reza Jalali, of course, the Iranian Swedish scholar of disaster medicine currently on death row in Iran. And this is a, a verdict the Iranian authorities have threatened to carry out on more than one occasion, with the resulting mental and physical pressure on Dr. Jalali and his family difficult to comprehend. And as Claudia mentioned, um, this is a case that many colleagues throughout the SAR network are intimately familiar with, as they have engaged in countless campaigns to raise his profile, to keep his case on the political agenda, and ultimately to bring Dr. Jalali home to his family. Sadly, his case is just one of several difficult cases that SAR focuses on as part of our Scholars in Prison project, a cause we champion when the offer of sanctuary is not an option. Scholars, of course, are targeted not only because of the content of their work, but also because of their status, their education, the fact that they've traveled frequently, their professional standing and public profile. But they are also targeted as, as a result of their peaceful exercise of their basic human rights, in particular, the right of freedom of expression and freedom of association. But it is not only individual scholars and students that suffer attacks in response to what they research, write, or say in class. Authoritarians target universities at large because of what they are, the knowledge that they produce, and the threat they represent to power. The motivation behind attacks on the higher education community is to silence or alter the university space either by sending a chilling message that certain ideas are off limits, or by forcing policies intended to make the university space just another venue where political power is exercised and political will imposed. The challenge free, healthy universities pose to authoritarian rule is similar to the threat that an independent judiciary, a free press, or competent human rights defenders pose. And so that is why they are targeted and that is why they need, we need these institutions to receive the same care, protection, and recognition as one of the key tenets of democracy. Because historically, that has not been the case. To give just one example, within the UN's universal periodic review process, states have made recommendations concerning journalists or human rights defenders more than a thousand times since the process was established. There have been fewer than 20 recommendations concerning academic freedom or the rights of scholars. This year's Free to Think report documents 332 attacks on higher education communities in 65 countries and territories. And these attacks are occurring worldwide, including in Europe, with serious attacks reported in Turkey, Hungary, and Russia, for example. Although Scholars at Risk's advocacy work is global, I mention these particular reports of violations within Europe today to remind us that Europe is far from immune to such threats. That is why it is to be warmly welcomed that there is significant attention at the European level to the topic of academic freedom, including the need to expand supports for individual scholars seeking assistance, especially in light of the atrocities in Afghanistan and Ukraine. The key policy documents that have emerged from the European higher education area, European education and research areas, and the European Commission have consistently and with growing emphasis pointed to the importance of academic freedom and institutional autonomy as core values of higher education, research, and innovation, and indeed of democratic society at large. 
These statements, declaration and declarations and reports have emphasised the need to cherish, protect and defend these rights and values in Europe, but also in our international relationships. And this is essential, as it is important to remember that repression and interference with academic freedom has become increasingly internationalised, not only because threats can now cross borders, but also because of competition, the marketization of higher education, and the ever-growing need to secure more funds has rendered our institutions vulnerable. From SAR Europe's perspective, while we warmly welcome these initiatives, we would caution that they require meaningful implementation in order to ensure that academic freedom is fully integrated into European norms, standards and practices, and actively promoted amongst academics and academic institutions alike. And therefore, it is timely that today's panel will draw attention to how support for academic freedom has been and might continue to be fully integrated in practical ways and with the emergence of ever more concrete proposals, such as the new European Research Area Policy Agenda, the European University Strategy, and the European Commission's Toolkit to help mitigate foreign interference in research and innovation. There is much to discuss and indeed to welcome. And my fellow panelists here today will detail some of these excellent measures currently underway. Finally, this panel is an opportunity to consider ways in which higher education and human rights policymakers at the European level might enhance their cooperation on these topics, and how universities, associations, NGOs, and other stakeholders can support these recent promising intergovernmental commitments to ensure their meaningful realization, including, if needs be, through additional concrete actions at the level of national ministries, networks, and universities. Thank you. Thank you, Denise, uh, for uh, providing the context and also for mentioning some of these uh, prominent documents that have been adopted. Uh, we could maybe add uh, uh, the Bonn Declaration uh, uh, that has been adopted in 2020, uh, the Rome Communique that has been adopted. These are documents that are well known uh, at the level of uh, the governance of our universities, and so we're trying to find ways in which uh, we as uh, SAR members and delegates in SAR, we can actually push our governance uh, uh, to respond uh, to those uh, commitments uh, in very practical manner. And that's why we are actually uh, looking forward to hear from you uh, what kind of actions uh, are being taken at the European level and, and what kind of actions could be taken at the level of uh, universities. So I'm giving the floor to Maria Mitic, as I said, a policy analyst of the Marie Sklodowska Curie Action. Uh, and I understand that she is uh, part of a team involved uh, in support for researchers at risk uh, under the program, including uh, Marie Sklodowska Kuri Action for uh, Ukraine. Maria, please, you have the floor. Um, thank you. I hope you can hear me still. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, first of all, um, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. Um, on behalf of the Marie Skoda Security Actions team, um, and on my personal behalf, uh, and also actually happy Octocentenary, and I wish you all the best in your future work. Um, yeah, indeed, I would maybe like to start um, with the, what you have just ended up ended with, and these are some of the, the policy commitments that uh, guide the governance uh, of your university, but also that we adhere to, uh, and that are very important for, for us. Um, as well as, I mean, the, the overarching, and this is the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU, where fundamental values, especially in the Article 13, are explicitly mentioned in the freedom of, uh, of academic research. And I think it's very important to mention this be before delving into the details of how MSCA as the program supports specifically academic freedom. Um, I think maybe to give you a little bit, uh, not too long, but to give you maybe a little bit the background for those of you who are maybe not so familiar with the uh, Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions, and then I will explain how specifically we support researchers at risk. Um, MSCA is part of, of, of Horizon Europe um, or, or framework programs, uh, but we are actually also at the crossroads of education and research in the sense that um, we support uh, training mobility, um, and career development of researchers uh, of all stages of their career. Um, and we also support uh, cooperation among organizations, not only academic, um, but also other uh, organizations from, from other sectors. 
And for us, uh, what they are the guiding uh, priorities are horizontal, three horizontal priorities, this interdisciplinarity, international aspects, um, and intersectoral, as I already said. We are a bottom-up project. This means that we are open to researchers from, from any country, from any area of research. Uh, and that and all at all stages of, of their research. So in this in this regard, uh, MSCA as such as a program uh, can support also researchers who are at risk or who have the status to, to qualify them as such. What we do know um, is that MSCA is a highly competitive program and we are fully aware of this and there are certain restrictions in the program itself uh, that perhaps are not really fully uh, meeting the needs of, of uh, researchers who are at risk and of their career path, of their personal path as well, and trajectories. Um, so as one of the, the measures that we have done um, is actually that in, uh, in cooperation with the with Inspire Europe project, of which I will uh, talk a bit more a bit later, um, is that we have developed guidelines um, on the inclusion of researchers at risk by which we encourage actually MSCA funded projects to include and to involve researchers at risk in their in their projects and research activities. Uh, now let me jump a little bit back to also um, explain how else we are supporting researchers at risk. So MSCA has five main actions through which we support doctoral candidates through our doctoral programs, we support postdoctoral fellows, we support staff exchanges and we support also national and regional initiatives through our co-fund action. Uh, basically by topping up uh, the ongoing uh, projects and initiatives. Uh, we have also an action that focuses on engaging citizens and bringing science closer to them. It is called MSCA and citizens. Now, on top of these five main actions, we also have support actions. And these support actions are usually grants of three or four years uh, that we provide for specific thematic priorities that we where we find that perhaps we would need a bit more support or we would be, need some more expertise to guide our work. And to give you an example, we have now just uh, started a project which focuses on international cooperation and we have a consortium of highly qualified organizations who will actually support our efforts in promoting international cooperation under MSCA and also mapping um, mapping also uh, the trends and developments in, in international cooperation. Now, this is one of the examples. We also have our alumni association that we support through these support actions and our very, very important network of national contact points. In the same vein, as uh, since 2019, we have been supporting also re researchers at risk uh, through first the Inspire Europe project, um, which um, actually is just ending. Um, and also through uh, the, the, its successor, Inspire Europe Plus, uh, which will start uh, very, very soon and will last until 2025. So both projects are run by SAR Europe and uh, have a, a team of qualified, a consortium of qualified organizations across Europe and not only, um, who, are, who have been uh, working hard uh, over the past uh, three years and will be working in the next three years to actually uh, strengthen the network of national support structures, but also to support researchers and also to bring them in um, in touch and guide them through uh, with the different, uh, let's say, employment opportunities and organizations um, and to, to uh, support exchange, peer learning and cooperation uh, across Europe. So obviously cooperation with the, with the team was good. Uh, it continues, as I said, until 2025. Um, and on top of this, um, you mentioned briefly uh, in the introduction, um, the recent developments uh, in Ukraine had actually um, led us to, to really uh, seek for very, very rapid response and to manage to mobilize uh, some resources through which we will be able to support a um, certain number of uh, researchers uh, from Ukraine to continue their research and their work um, in the EU and the Horizon Europe uh, associated countries. So we have um, recently launched the scheme, MSCA for Ukraine, um, which is our response uh, to, the, to the situation and through which we will be able to fund up to uh, 200 researchers um, who are either a doctoral level or a postdoctoral level. So meaning um, candidates who are, have been enrolled 
in a in a higher education institution in Ukraine and those who already have a degree um, and who have fled uh, Ukraine uh, on or after the 24th of February, meaning that we are actually applying the principles of the temporary protection directive. So this is something that is now, because one of the questions I think was our current priority, this is something that we have really been focusing a lot on uh, in the in the past months and something that is currently also going on and we hope to have much more news uh, to share with you uh, in the, the next couple of weeks. So I think from my side for now, I will I will stop here uh, and give the floor to other colleagues. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for providing this um, information. Uh, of course, uh, there will be questions uh, that we can ask uh, later on, but now we move on with the next speaker. So I'm inviting uh, Slaven Mislincevic, uh, uh, policy officer at the research area, uh, policy agenda. And I understand you've been working on developing guidelines uh, uh, to face uh, um, global interference or external interference. So, Slavin, you have the floor. Thank you very much for your, for your invitation and for having me here. Good afternoon, everyone. Your introduction was entirely correct. So over the last little bit more than one year and a half, I have been keeping myself busy with, uh, with a topic which, which we call foreign interference. Um, I work in Director General for Research Innovation at European Commission, and the topic of foreign interference is a topic that was very new for us. So basically, when, when we started working on this topic, and and of course we knew that the, the that the phenomena of foreign interference in the European university and academic world has been there for quite some time, but what really caught our attention was the increasing rate to which extent we have been observing these type of issues, to the magnitude, to the complexity of the foreign interference threats, and to the potential future dangers triggered by increasing geopolitical tensions. And so consequently, the European Commission started to investigate in close collaboration with the member states and relevant stakeholders. With relevant stakeholders, I'm thinking of um, RNI institutions, including higher education institutions, um, research and technology organizations, uh, research infrastructures, research funding organizations, industry, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to actually better understand what are the tactics and tools used by foreign actors, but also how are these issues currently handled within the European Union, and both on the level of member states, level of regions, level of organizations, but also even on the level of individuals. And what we actually wanted to learn from this was whether EU action is actually needed when it comes to tackling foreign interference in r &I landscape. What became obvious is that if you look at the level of the member states, that it is quite difficult for for individual member states to tackle some of these very complex uh, issues simply because they don't possess the know-how, they don't have the resources, and often um, they focus, it's, it's really hard to focus on so many different third countries which are often using different tactics, etc. Also, if you then, when we actually then looked on the level of, for example, individual universities, this was also very clear. On one hand, we saw that a lot of universities and other online actors were not sufficiently aware about the potential issues related to uh, foreign interference and that, that they might actually be a victim of this. But even more, even if they were aware of these issues, they didn't really know how to respond from this. And so that's why over the, like I said, one year and a half, we have been working and I had the opportunity to, to lead this work on the development of what we call a staff working document on uh, tackling RNI for interference, which is basically an inventory of possible mitigation measures about how to prevent foreign interference from happening, how to identify it, but also how to recover from it in case foreign interference is observed at your uh, at the institution that is that is targeted and the entire document which is around 60 pages i can also perhaps put a link there or perhaps this will be also shared in another communication but the entire document which is around 50 pages focuses on um, five different chap five, five different main topics so the first is what is actually for interference um, before actually advancing to work on this, we actually had to come up with a clear definition of what we see under foreign interference. And basically what we see 
how we see for interference is actually as activities that are carried out by or on behalf of a foreign actor, which are coercive, covert, deceptive, or, con or corrupting, and that are contrary to EU sovereignty, values, and interests. So I emphasize the words sovereignty, values, and interests. And then what we actually tried to do is, was to uh, identify um, what are the potential vulnerabilities if you look at foreign interference. There's so many different angles set to this. And we, we have identified four what we call four areas of attention, which are the values, governance, partnerships, and cybersecurity. And the entire document is actually also structured around these four, uh, four areas of attention. So we have one chapter which focuses on more of what is foreign interference, it's kind of really to inform the reader, to, to, to um, attract their attention. And then in each chapter we go, into more detail, but what uh, or how values, how governance, partnership, and cybersecurity are impacted by, by foreign interference. The first, I would say, concrete chapter is really the chapter on values. And this is actually where uh, we go into quite a detail about um, uh, academic freedom. Concretely, we, we suggest a couple of mitigation measures, a couple of preventive measures about how academic freedom can be protected. Um, a lot of attention goes to understanding your internal environment better. Um, also understanding the environment in which your partner is, is operating uh, to see to which extent this partner can be influenced, can be coerced, or might also actually pose a danger uh, for, for you in this international uh, cooperation. And uh, what we actually also try to really emphasize throughout this, because we're also aware that uh, while I would say even the success of today's European universities, for example, are really have, have actually uh, benefit, have actually benefited from international cooperation um, by publishing this document, we don't want to limit international cooperation at all. But what we actually are trying to do is to create an environment in which, what we and you often use the same term, in which uh, um, benefits are maximized and uh, risks are minimized. Um, and to make it possible for, um, for example, European universities to really have a clear idea of what are the risks associated uh, with to engaging in certain cooperation. And while being aware of what the risks are, we still encourage them to continue collaborating, but just to make sure that the terms of collaboration respect well the interests of, of each European institution. Um, so this, this document has been published on the 18th of, uh, 18th of January last year. It has been very well received. It has also formed the basis of, for example, what um, under the G7 presidency, under the German G7 presidency is being done in context also to academic uh, freedom and uh, freedom of scientific uh, research. So we definitely uh, see the uptake of this document um, as, a, as, a, as quite successful. However, as with everything, uh, this does not mean that we have this document now in place, that everything is uh, sorted uh, out. We see the increasing need to continue supporting both individuals, um, institutions, and member states in um, better understanding the risks and quicker and, be, and being better, or let's say having the cap uh, capacities to respond better to this type of um, to this type of issues. Um, in the future, we have also a couple of. I mean, we already have a couple of other initiatives in in the pipeline that are, I would say, could almost be seen as follow up actions to this publication of 18th of. Uh, this uh, January, but in each case, we are now really still also monitoring how this document is being used, what are the lessons learned from that, and perhaps how can we improve this document in the future as well. Thank you, Slavin, very much. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, thanks also to Maria Edstrom for sharing the link uh, to the document, and we will circulate uh, for those who are here in presence. Um, I think this uh, this whole topic, which is, uh, as you say, quite new, but of course it's challenging. It speaks closely to what we were discussing yesterday in this uh, hall in terms of responsible internationalization and the ways in which we need to rethink and consider the, the, the ways we conceptualize internationalization and also how do we operate in that context. Uh, 
So this document will be precious, of course. Um, so I'm now giving the floor to Axel Leisenberger, Leisenberger, apologies, policy officer of the French Ministry for Higher Education and Research, and his missions include defining and promoting national positions um, in the EU policymaking process on international cooperation in higher education, research, and innovation. Uh, we welcome uh, the uh, Marseille declar declaration that was adopted uh, in March, uh, so I'm sure you will also make reference to this uh, uh, yet another relevant document. Uh, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon to, to all of you, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Claudia, for this um, presentation. It's really an honor to be uh, here with you uh, this afternoon in, in this conference, and uh, I also say good afternoon to, to the audience that uh, is in Padua. I only have uh, a very small uh, window seeing you, um, but uh, uh, I suppose um, that, uh, that you are having a very good time uh, at University of Padua. I have a little uh, presentation that I um, try to share uh, now, and I hope you can see it. Perfect, thank you yes, so much. Uh, so, well, uh, indeed, I am a policy officer at the Ministry for Higher Education and Research um, uh, of France. Uh, so we are currently the presidency uh, of the Council of the European Union for, for a couple of days uh, left. Um, and indeed, we had uh, an emphasis uh, during our presidency on international cooperation, so including also the question on um, uh, academic freedom. Uh, so uh, what I want to do is uh, to provide you input uh, on three uh, uh, elements, so mainly on first the, the, on the French presidency and uh, what were our objectives and also then the impact that uh, our presidents, uh, the impact, sorry, that the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine had on our presidency and especially in terms of research, innovation and higher education. And then um, have a couple of words left on the uh, newly uh, created um, uh, global approach subgroup of the ERA forum uh, so the European Research Area Forum, sorry, it's a very uh, technical name uh, actually for something that I will present uh, later on and then I hope it, uh, it becomes a bit clearer. So, but let's start with the French Presidency of the Council. So this slide um, very shortly is just to remind you the objectives uh, that the French Presidency has defined in the fields of higher education, research and innovation. And of course here I would like to emphasize that we had in our objectives structuring the international dimension of European higher education research and innovation policies. And indeed here, uh, we said that um, uh, um, it is really uh, needed, or we wanted to underscore the need to uphold the EU's values and uh, interests and principles, as well as the requirement for global standards, in particular for intellectual property, to assert the EU's role as a driving force and initiator of uh, such uh, standards. But this includes, of course, also um, academic freedom. Um, so we, uh, what actually were we doing? So the agenda was uh, on international cooperation uh, was well packed uh, those, uh, this last year in research, innovation and higher education. So uh, there was a new strategy that was published by the European Commission uh, in 2021 on the global approach to research and innovation. And the guidelines that uh, Slavin was uh, talking about were also part of this uh, strategy. So it's uh, going to be realized already. Um, under the uh, Slovenian presidency last year, we had already some council conclusions on this new strategy coming from the Commission, where we endorsed actually the principles of this um, uh, uh, this uh, new strategy that seeks um, uh, for uh, rebalancing international cooperation where it is necessary, based on values and principles. And uh, member states asked uh, the Commission uh, and themselves, so the governments of member states, to um, actually uh, develop or continue developing the uh, principles and the values that should underscore our, our collaboration with international partners. I also want to mention the European Strategy for Universities, another uh, a communication that was published uh, this at the beginning of this year on the 18th of January, so I think it's the same day as the guidelines, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Slavin. Um, where uh, actually also uh, there was um, uh, a chapter on international cooperation, uh, international dimension of universities, also uh, based on, on values uh, such as academic freedom. So now um, I'm moving to, to our conference that we organized uh, on the 8th of March um, in Marseille. Um, it was a, a presidency conference on the global approach to research, innovation and higher education. So 
we gathered in Marseille the ministers of the member states uh, responsible for research and innovation in order to facilitate the discussions between the member states to agree on key principles and values of international cooperation. We did not do this from scratch, of course, but uh, the, uh, building on all the strategies that I have mentioned and uh, other initiatives, as for example, the, the already named uh, Bonn Declaration. Um, we also wanted to underline the orientations of the Union's policy on cooperation uh, with third countries. So it was, of course, just a couple of days after, uh, so the 8th of March was just a couple of days after the invasion uh, of Ukraine. And of course, it had a very important impact, as, um, as was shown in the discussions of the ministers. Uh, and they really wanted to emphasize, and this was what, what I take out of this conference as well, uh, emphasize the need to uphold uh, specific values uh, that should be the basis, actually, of our cooperation. And of course, um, academic freedom uh, was uh, at the core of these discussions we had in Marseille. And now um, I come to the, the so-called Marseille Declaration. Indeed, uh, Claudia, oh, you already mentioned it. Uh, we had this debate on principles and values on, of international cooperation. And uh, the outcome is, uh, uh, yes, these nine principles and values that you see on the screen on different topics. I also can uh, provide you with the link, of course, to the Marseille Declaration. If you do not already have it, I will put it in, in the chat uh, right after. Um, so this declaration provides a framework for the future for fair, open, inclusive, participatory science that works for the common good, which will form the basis for dialogue with non-EU countries. And here you see the very first value uh, is the freedom of scientific research. So based on the already existing Bonn Declaration, but you see all the other um, values and principles that we thought would uh, be or are uh, very important for international cooperation in order to uh, provide our researchers, but also our students uh, with a safe environment in order to, to make them, uh, to engage them uh, internationally, to make them work with uh, their partners uh, in third countries. So what was the follow-up of this, uh, this conference? Uh, on the 10th of June, we had another meeting of uh, EU Ministers for Research and Innovation. This one was a formal meeting uh, in the Council uh, in Luxembourg, and uh, they actually endorsed the principles and values in international R&I cooperation. And this is the basis for something that will happen on the 8th of July. This is a launch, the launch of a multilateral dialogue on principles and values in international uh, cooperation uh, in research and innovation. And uh, um, this will be a dialogue uh, organized by the European Commission uh, together with the member states, with third countries, in order to um, discuss the basis of our future uh, cooperation uh, with them that should, base, should be based on, uh, on specific values and principles and uh, in which uh, we find also academic freedom. So the very uh, last part of the of the um, uh, this short presentation is uh, um, on this uh, newly group. It's an expert group of the European Research Area Forum. It's part of the governance of uh, uh, the R&I policies at the European level. So the the forum is um, uh, 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 in the forum you find the European Commission, member states, and stakeholders, and one specific subgroup. Uh, is um, dedicated to international cooperation in research and innovation, and we call it the Global Approach to R&I uh, subgroup. Um, and here you find uh, what we are going to do is to advise the Commission and find common, uh, common ground um, on our positions towards third countries. And in the middle, you find this multilateral dialogue on the values and principles for international R&I cooperation. But you find uh, also in the other items that we are going to deal with, where we are going to discuss commission member states and stakeholders. Um, uh, and you will find there also the, the importance of uh, upholding values such as um, academic freedom, for example, in Team Europe approaches that we are going to conduct with uh, African, uh, for example, in Africa, but also the European science diplomacy agenda where um, uh, academic freedom should uh, play an important role. So I will stop here for now. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Axel. Thank you very much. Um, I guess we have a good sense of uh, the articulation of uh, the topics and how they are related one to the other. I wonder if Denise uh, has uh, comments herself uh, or maybe she would like to pose questions to our guests. 
Thank you, Claudia. So it is very clear from what our panelists have shared today that there is a significant amount of work underway, not only to protect and promote academic freedom, but to assist at-risk scholars. And crucially, this work has moved on from statements and declarations towards the necessary, but perhaps more difficult phase of implementing these aspirations and the complicated practicalities and realities of doing so. And the multiplicity of these actions is to be commended. And most particularly, um, Sarah Europe would like to um, warmly welcome um, how quickly the European Commission and the MSCA unit acted in establishing and setting up MSCA for Ukraine. And this essential scheme will um, ensure support for displaced colleagues from Ukraine. Um, although by welcoming this initiative, um, we would also say that our Europe, as well as our, um, our colleagues in Inspire, um, would still push and still advocate strongly for a Europe-wide fellowship programme, one that would not be limited by geographical region, um, but we and we would also support the establishment of more national-based programmes as well, like the ones that already exist in France and Germany. Um, the toolkit that Slavin was talking about is actually um, a really interesting document that I would encourage everyone here today to, to review and to read, um, because it really understands what we're trying to do around academic freedom, that it is, um, that many people are aware of it, but are they, do they understand it to the same degree as they are aware of it? And what this document does is advocate for things that SAR has been talking about and pushing for for a very long time when it comes to um, deepening that understanding around academic freedom. So um, the document recommends perhaps um, integrating academic freedom within modules um, in core curriculums in universities. And it also supports the establishment of setting up sanctuaries for and, and inviting at-risk scholars onto campuses. Um, so, and, and also to, to set up support systems for for scholars and visiting students from countries that perhaps um, are as not as open as the ones that they are visiting. So it's a really detailed and articulate document that goes to the heart of the things that we need to do to protect academic freedom. And the um, Marseille Declaration, again, it is kind of a signpost to, to those science organizations that if you want to collaborate with the EU, you have to value certain principles. And one of those, of course, is scientific freedom. Um, so all of these things are very much to be commended. Um, however, from, I suppose, as your perspective, we would be keen to understand how all these policies and initiatives interact with each other and to what extent there are fixed pathways of communications between the various stakeholders leading these initiatives. Um, because these are not the only initiatives underway um, in, in, in relation to academic freedom, because it is also listed as a priority and a key consideration in both the European Commission's Human Rights and Democracy Action Plan, which navigates the EU's relationships with third countries, but also the Democracy Action Plan, which applies to member states themselves. And in recent conversations with the um, European External Action Service, they were very keen to impress that academic freedom is a key item for them and for their consideration. And with academic freedom also intersecting in the new science diplomacy agenda and all it entails, we have to ask, is now the time to consider establishing a clear point of contact or an entry point within the European system for academic freedom and researchers at risk, such as a, um, a dedicated special rapporteur or a dedicated office or ombudsman, um, someone who can facilitate and advance cooperation between higher, the higher education space and the human rights space, because of course academic freedom is not just a fundamental value, it is also a human right. And indeed, um, the partners of Inspire in a recent policy paper that they have released um, have also called for the establishment of a contact point, arguing that this help could help to advance collaboration and synergies between thus far separate initiatives and funds of different directorate generals and their respective agencies. And also I have to, I wish to comment that there is um, a recent open letter that um, was produced by the European Universities Association, the European Students' Union, the Polish National Agency for Academic Exchange, amongst many other similar-minded agencies. It's all calling for the establishment of an expert group to facilitate the policy dialogue between EU institutions, member states, and stakeholder organizations. So, this has been much discussed um, outside of government circles, so I would be very interested to hear from my fellow panelists on what current efforts towards coordination look like and how such coordination efforts could perhaps be strengthened. 
Thank you, Denise. Uh, I think we can um, go in the same uh, order uh, of presentation. So maybe Maria would like to go first and address uh, Denise's question. Yeah, sure. Um, well, to start with, um, I'm sure Denise is also aware that we are fully aware <laughs> of these of these discussions, and they were part of also the policy recommendations that were put forward as uh, as part of the Inspire Europe project. And we have had already some um, exchanges in this regard. Um, I think the the position, and the, you know, it is very clear why uh, such a First of all, let's say having a coordinated group would be needed or having a contact point would be needed from the operational point of view. However, I'm sure that you are also fully aware of uh, that um, this um, is difficult in practice in the sense or policy uh, or competence related uh, way um, to have this because we deal in different aspects with different competencies on different, you know, uh, in different ways with the, with the topic itself. So it is not that the will is not there, it is not that the discussions are not there, but um, we have, are currently looking into a kind of a longer term perspective into how we could mobilize uh, certain DGs uh, that we have been in touch with uh, less formally, less in a less structured way, because this is happening, because I think this is also one of the points to highlight. This is happening and exchanges do exist. Um, to give you an example also with, with Slaven, we were in contact in early March about the sense for refugees, uh, part of the Euraxis portal or with colleagues from DigiNear. So enlargement and neighborhood, we were in touch with the support group uh, for um, Ukraine in preparation of the MSCA for Ukraine call because we also wanted their advice and their suggestions. So exchanges do exist. If we are talking about more formal structure, this is something that as many other things will, will take time and some thinking through because I think ultimately we will all agree that the goal is that the goal is to, you know, after hopefully having learned lessons in the past several years, I think we do want to have a structure that is sustainable and resilient so that we don't respond in an ad hoc manner as we have been doing, but that, you know, we can create certain coordination structure that can actually respond in a different way to whatever can happen and that they can address um, not only the questions of academic reader, but uh, many other related questions in a, in a, let's say, more coherent way. So. Indeed, to confirm that discussions are there, and we are trying to see how we can, in cooperation with you know other services of uh, not only the Commission, because we also are aware of the the initiatives coming from the European Parliament, concretely also MEP Ella and his proposal. So we are uh, aware and we are in touch. But I think it will take also some further discussion to see how we can make do this in a sustainable way. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Slaven, you may want to take the floor. Thank you. Well, just to start with, I can just amplify what Maria has, has mentioned. But even more, actually, I want to stress that if, if we want to make progress when it comes to protecting academic freedom, we have to acknowledge that this is a shared responsibility. Um, and if we really want to do this successfully, then we definitely have to act on, uh, on different levels. And um, I think when it comes to coordination and collaboration on different levels, um, from my experience, for example, with the staff working documents on tackling r for interference, I think this has been a quite a successful process in the sense that, for example, in the lead was DG RNI, but we worked closely together with, uh, with DJ EAC and JRC. But even more, um, throughout the entire process of drafting these documents, we have been in close contact with the member states and with many stakeholders. And when it comes to stakeholders, we not only talk with uh, associations, but also with, with, with individual universities, uh, individual private companies, even, individual, in, even individuals, we need to understand that how can we have something which is practical and useful on the ground. And, and this can only be achieved if you really work, if you work together. So I think this is the first example of what I think, and I would say the first main achievement. If you look towards the future and there is one development which I haven't uh, mentioned in the previous um, 
in my when I was answering the previous question, was that um, as part of this era forum and era policy agenda, I think this is what Axel addressed briefly. Um, Denise used the term era policy agenda action six, but really to make things uh, simple, um, ends of November in November last year. And there has been a council recommendation on the Pact for Research Innovation in Europe, which we call Pact for RNI. It contains a list of values uh, and principles that have to be protected, but also it has a reference to 20 actions on which there should be a collaboration between the member states and the European Commission. And one of these actions, which we call Action 6, focuses on the development of a policy approach to safeguard academic freedom in Europe. And how this actually works is, is actually it acknowledges a very simple fact, uh, like I said, this is a shared responsibility. If there are some things that can be done on the EU level, but we really have to work together with the member states uh, to make this actually happen. And the whole work when it comes to this action six happens in the context of what we call ERA Forum. Um, during which we are presenting the work, we are having uh, brainstorm sessions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, regarding how we can uh, develop several actions which are part of this Europe policy agenda. Six. I can go into more detail a little bit later, but what I want to say is that I think there is a clear understanding of uh, the need to coordinate, uh, and that this definitely cannot be tackled in uh, in isolation. Thank you, Slaven. Thank you for pointing out this uh, need to consider coordination not only at the European level but across levels. I think this is something that we're facing as a challenge uh, uh, in the national context, uh, uh, for sure, in Italy. So how do we develop coordination between universities and particularly between universities and institutions, uh, the government, the different ministries? Uh, so in inviting uh, uh, Axel uh, uh, to reply to Denise's question, maybe there is also <laughs> something that I would like to add. We have been looking at the POST program as a very interesting model in terms of the coordination between the different ministries uh, that you managed to realize in, the con in that context. And so we're wondering, again, the question is, how do you see coordination, but maybe what are some of the tips uh, or what are the challenges also uh, to have at the national level coordination in that respect? Okay, thank you so much for, for the question. And first of all, I just want to say that uh, I agree to my previous speakers. Of course, coordination is key, and we already have a fora for, for coordination, such as the this famous subgroup that, uh, that I have presented earlier. But uh, even before, there existed uh, uh, groups well, on very technical level, but uh, implicating ministries of member states, the commission, and even stakeholders in order to work on uh, coordinating our international cooperation policies. And here, of course, um, this debate on values principles such as academic freedom uh, is part of. I also want to remind that uh, um, last year there was uh, already an opinion of um, uh, a member states uh, coordination body that uh, was called uh, SFIC uh, at this time. I do not want to enter into details because it does not exist anymore, but however, it used to, and uh, it uh, made an opinion uh, following the Bonn Declaration on, like, uh, on, on the freedom of scientific research, uh, where we found some very interesting uh, findings. So member states, experts of member states on international cooperation and academic freedom uh, indeed stated that they, uh, that they were in favor of setting up a dedicated fellowship scheme open to non-EU researchers um, which uh, um, uh, liberty or freedom of scientific re research is under threat in third countries and uh, which would make the EU really effectively uh, a safe haven for scientific research. Uh, this such a fellow uh, 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 ship scheme could build on the proposal that was made by Inspire Europe uh, consortium indeed and make reference to um, what have been developed by scholars at risk uh, categorization of threats. Um, so indeed there are uh, this coordination already had some some impact indeed in making concrete uh, proposals. Another proposal was to uh, be, um, set up uh, an EU ombudsman on uh, the freedom of uh, scientific research. Uh, so um, I think coordination uh, mechanisms do exist. Of course, we, we should make uh, full uh, advantage of uh, such mechanisms and uh, also already uh, always uh, sorry mobilize 
the administrations of member states, but also stakeholders to, to take part in the debate. Uh, indeed, we have uh, very technical terms. We use very technical terms. We work in very technical groups that uh, uh, is very difficult to understand from the outside, but be assured that uh, um, uh, from the member states uh, side, uh, this topic is really uh, important and we always try to uh, make things better and to, to, to actually to group in order to, to have good proposals uh, in terms uh, uh, on uh, advancing academic uh, uh, freedom uh, in the European Union. Thank you, Axel, very much. Um, I think we can still have one question from the chair and then we can open uh, uh, to for, for questions uh, from the public. Uh, um, I think it's, it's very... Because we can't see really from here. I think Slaven wanted to add something on this point. Yes, indeed, indeed. Yes, indeed, actually, because um, I actually think, I mean, what, what, what has been uh, said by Axel and, and, and Maria, I, I think definitely covers um, the entire spectrum. However, I think often we talk about this topic of academic freedom and protecting it. We often look very much at what is happening on different levels, but still we stay with, inside the EU. And I think it's important to acknowledge that this is not just, this is not a European value. Uh, there are much more like-minded partners who are actually working on this as well. And so if we talk about coordination and collaboration, we should, of course, look at the different levels, we should look at different sectors, etc. But we also have to acknowledge that if we want to have an impact on, on the global scale and, and, and really to uh, protect academic freedom, not just inside the EU, but also outside, is that we have to work together with like-minded uh, with like-minded um, partners and i think the whole discussion also comes in very timely because in may last year under the uk presidency of g7 the research compact has been adopted this resulted in a g7 working group on what we call sigre which really focuses on knowledge security also for interference is part of that, but also the whole discussions about, about values and principles is there. And this is a very important development because if we talk about academic freedom with international partners from some other uh, countries, it's important that we promote this as universal values and not so much as something that is a European value that we are trying to, I would say, um, push, but at least promote towards the rest of the world. So perhaps just also add this additional um, global dimension to the entire discussion of uh, of academic freedom. Thank you very much. Um, so maybe one last point uh, from from us. Uh, um, I think it's highly relevant to be aware of all this, which is happening at the EU level, beyond EU level. Um, as uh, SAR International, we're also following closely some of the developments in other regions, uh, like uh, uh, a coordination across the Americas, for instance, among uh, SAR sections. Uh, so at the different levels, uh, including non-institutional, there are developments. But then, of course, when it comes to implement and put in practice, the principles universities uh, are called uh, in the first place to give an answer. Uh, and so our question to you is, uh, how do you see from your observatory and your perspective and experience uh, the role and responsibility of universities? Uh, these are issues that we would like to continue to discuss uh, over the next uh, couple of days. Uh, and so it would be great to have your, uh, uh, your view on this. Maybe we can actually start from Slavin, since you have the mic. Thank you for this. So, um, I think that the, the link or the role of universities when it comes to protecting academic freedom has been very well described in the European strategy uh, for universities. Axel and also Denise referred to this document, which indeed has been published on the same day as the South African document of tackling RNI foreign interference. And there what we see is that um, universities are and need to remain place of freedom for speech, thought, learning, research and academic freedom at large. Um, it also stresses that academic freedom alone cannot be 
isolated from the whole discussion of institutional autonomy. These two topics are strongly interlinked and it's really about finding, I would say, uh, the right, uh, right balance between, between the two. Um, moreover, um, what we have actually also seen is that in the in the preparation of the European strategy for for, for universities is that universities have been quite quite vocal uh, in sharing concerns uh, about threats to academic freedom and university autonomy, um, coming both both from third countries but also internally. And we have also seen, I would say, almost an explosion in number of publications and, and research that has been done um, on this topic. So it's clearly, it's clearly a very important topic for the universities. Universities are also uh, taking a lead in uh, and very ex being extremely proactive in looking at how can uh, they contribute to, uh, to the protection of uh, academic freedom. Thank you, Slaven. Um, so maybe Maria, if you want to pick up on this uh, point, we realize that some of the of the suggestions are certainly, you know, to promote debates uh, around the issues, uh, to include the principles into our uh, uh, teaching, uh, learning activities. Uh, so to make that part of the university life, uh, possibly also to adopt uh, um, tools uh, like the Academic Freedom Index. Uh, what would be your suggestion in this case? Well, I, uh, I would maybe, if you don't mind, go also more on the level of action, because I fully agree with what has been said by Slaven, and I think maybe just to add to this, um, well, the, the, you know, the, the policy commitments that actually come as the initiative of universities, I don't know, from the Pol Bologna follow-up group in the Rome Communique, but also the Magna Carta Universitat. And so the, all these, you know, uh, initiatives, indeed, uh, the, the universities are the, the center, and this is, I think we all agree on this, but on a more um, operational or engagement level, I think universities do pick up on the word of responsibility. But I think that universities have this mobilizing power, as you know, the, the centers of, of the, the, the centers of, of knowledge and you know, knowledge authority, let us say, and the spaces of freedom also have this mobilizing power in their communities. Many, as we know, universities have created their local and regional communities. And I think across Europe, we have examples you know, of how universities can work with different actors uh, uh, in their communities to make things happen, you know, to deal with the different societal and challenges that we are facing. And to go back several years, because I think you were discussing, you know, how do we engage, how do we link, uh, how do we work with the national level uh, actors? I think we have um, to go to France, we have a very good example post 2015 of the men's network on of network universities who just decided, you know, and created a bottom up initiative in support you know, to support academic freedom researchers at risk, uh, and especially in response to the, the Syrian crisis and this uh, actually brought up to the the, the uh, endorsement uh, actually at the governmental level and at the national level and hence we even now have what we have in France. Also, we know that in Germany, universities first responded post 2015 simply as a humanitarian aid. It was simply solidarity in general at large. And this created the momentum, you know, get, got the federal support and, you know, and uh, turned into a strong support from top down or from the, the national authorities, you know, for the programs in universities in Germany across the country to actually focus on uh, educational and research activities. And I think this is where the, the engaging and, and mobilizing authority and power of universities is to create this, this uh, momentum and the, the critical mass to really make it influence. And I think really that universities are at the helm. Thank you, Maria. And last comment from Axel on this point, uh, since France has been mentioned. Yes, uh, indeed, and thank you, Maria, for, for bringing up the, the example of uh, the Pose Initiative uh, in France. And thank you also very much for, for this question. Indeed, uh, I have to say this is quite uh, challenging uh, for me, for someone working uh, uh, in the ministry, uh, because we are dealing with policy initiatives, such as the initiatives that I have mentioned during, during my presentations and uh, uh, intervention. But indeed, the question uh, uh, indeed is on, on what actually is the uptake from, from the universities uh, and what uh, uh, should be, what could be the role of universities in protecting uh, academic freedom. 
once again, I believe that uh, uh, from a policy point of view, we need to provide the framework uh, conditions uh, with respect, of course, to institutional autonomy, but still framework conditions for a safe and secure um, uh, international cooperation, um, protecting specific values and principles, such as uh, academic freedom. Um, the implementation, of course, of, of, of such principle, of the principle of academic freedom, but also the others, like uh, I want to mention ethics, uh, integrity, open science, uh, even gender issues and uh, intellectual property. Um, actually, it's the universities and research uh, organizations that have to uh, put them uh, in place. We can just provide you with, uh, with the framework, but uh, also depend or rely uh, on universities and university stakeholders and actually um, uh, uh, taking measures also to protecting academic freedom and then of course also if there is uh, specific problems to uh, to bring them up uh, in discussions with national authorities and uh, government in order then to provide measures that could be um, taken in order to, to protect these specific values or even uh, foreign interferences. So I think it's um, uh, an exchange uh, between uh, the government, uh, governmental authorities and universities uh, governance, but also individual researchers in order actually to, uh, to, to, to make sure that we can uh, um, effectively protect academic freedom. Thanks. Um, thank you, Axel. So I guess uh, we can uh, open the floor. We have a few minutes for questions and answer, if there are uh, <coughs> any. Um, what, you, what you just mentioned in terms of um, you know, uh, creativity at the university level, I think we're very lucky working with the SAR Europe and particularly with the Inspire Europe project that has been mentioned but not maybe described in detail. The fact that this has uh, certainly contributed to bring together universities in sharing practices, but also building on those practices and the studies that have been done in order to inform uh, uh, developments uh, at the level of the commission as well, as was mentioned. Uh, and I think some of the experiences that we're having, including this collaboration between SAR uh, Italy and SAR Sweden, uh, certainly go in, in that direction. So we are uh, certainly developing um, ideas. Uh, maybe uh, we could be more vocal and aware of and building on the documents and the different initiatives that you have been uh, mentioning as they are so relevant in providing the framework. So basically the framework is in place uh, and then of course uh, we need to find uh, ways in which uh, uh, the framework can be translated, keeping this uh, uh, dialogue possibly open with the institutions um, as well. So we have a microphone in the room. I wonder if there are any questions or comments uh, for our speakers, even from home. And if you can introduce yourself as you speak, thank you. Hello, okay, good afternoon. My name is Tamsir, uh, a student of the University of Padua at the Faculty of Political Science. Uh, human rights and international relations. Um, my question, I have seen that at the geographical level of the European Union, it has taken a very good shape of going in the right direction. But I have had the policy maker from France saying a lot of things that needs to be put into consideration and he spoke of it being global but haven't mentioned the standpoint of other parts around the world like in africa the americas asia at what level are they working toward this because i do understand one thing this, having these documents to be universal could be very, very important and could add a lot to innovation and development around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other uh, question? Maybe we can collect uh, a couple and then have a last round of uh, responses. There is one here. Uh, 
this is Shaharbono Heydari from Afghanistan. Uh, actually, uh, my question is about, um, uh, as you know, uh, in Afghanistan, um, many of female professors uh, are uh, firing by Taliban, and they are uh, staying at their home, and suddenly they are dependent on their husband, their father, their brothers. I mean, they couldn't go to hospital without a man. And uh, many of our students couldn't continue their education. But the problem is, in Afghanistan, uh, most of our students couldn't speak English. And they couldn't apply for a scholarship or um, for uh, continue their education. But here in Europe, the standard is very high from the uh, capacity of some of the girls in Afghanistan. Uh, I want to ask how European countries can help in this regard to family students, uh, professor student, sorry, female uh, professor who are staying at home, they couldn't continue their job, even if Taliban uh, didn't fire them, Taliban uh, forced them to stay their home and don't go to their job. And we are, we have many examples of this. Like my sister was head of department, but Taliban said to her, you should resign because a woman couldn't be head, head of department and then she resigned it. Many of women couldn't go to their job. But the problem is, uh, I hear from the uh, SAR colleagues, they are saying uh, we have the PhD, uh, the researcher should have the PhD uh, degree. But in Afghanistan, most of women don't have the PhD. Most of, uh, most of uh, ha have just a master degree or license because in Afghanistan, the education was tough for the women and for doing the PhD or master degree, we should go for, uh, out of the country. And it is the, another problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I understand Maria uh, was indicating it's not easy to follow what's going on here in the in the hall. Uh, so just very briefly, the first question is about how to take to how to make these efforts meaningful on a global level, if I understand correctly. Uh, so what's relevant for the European context and positive progress? Uh, how can that uh, become relevant to other regions? Uh, and what are the efforts in that respect? And the second comment was a testimony from, from Afghanistan uh, speaking about and for uh, women students and scholars and their current situation and highlighting some of the challenges uh, that students and professors are facing in the country uh, whereby not only they are uh, living uh, daily lives whereby they are uh, no longer able to attend university and to participate uh, in life, uh, but even if they were looking for other opportunities, uh, they have difficulties with the language, uh, their English proficiency is not always or often not sufficient, and they do not uh, often hold uh, PhD degrees uh, which are required maybe by European institutions in order to grant uh, the scholarships that are made available, so how to deal uh, with those issues. And Sorry. Um, just to, to say that today's panel really focused on um, what's happening within the context of the EU and the EU's initiatives. Um, but of course, um, academic freedom and attacks on academic freedom is a global problem um, and a global issue. Um, academic freedom is not a Western concept. Um, so there are multiple initiatives outside the EU that are also um, advocating for the protection and promotion of um, academic freedom. Um, at the Council of Europe, there's been several resolutions and a report most recently and, um, uh, and commitments on academic freedom. 
Uh, there's also at the um, Inter, um, human, uh, Inter um, Human Rights Commission um, in the Americas, they've actually published a series of principles around academic freedom. Um, the former UN Special Rapporteur David Kay on freedom of expression at the UN just about two years ago published a very detailed report on um, academic freedom itself. So there's lots of different initiatives happening across the globe, all towards protecting this right and understanding it in a more deep, in a deeper way. And it is about connecting a lot of these initiatives. Um, so particularly if you just look at the EU itself, we do have multiple directorates, um, all advocating for and all undertaking different initiatives on academic freedom, um, including their external action service. Um, what we would like to see at SAR is just more dialogue between them or, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, concrete pathways so that we know that they're talking to each other a little bit more um, so that we know that um, how so that, so that we can see what we're doing within the EU to protect academic freedom, what we're doing it in relation to our international relationships is also something that our external action service is also advocating for when they're positioned in different countries. Um, we know that they are actually undertaking a lot of work in relation to particular scholars or particular issues. And what we just really would like to see is more um, publication of that work and more, um, and more recording of that work. So, in, um, so they, if you look at their new action plan on human rights, they have committed to protecting academic freedom. And this year they published um, their annual human rights report and for the very first time there was actually a section on academic freedom which outlines for the first time um, their commitments around academic freedom. What we'd like to see next year is a section on what they're doing specifically for the safety of scholars, um, similar to how they document and account the safety or what they do for the safety of journalists. Um, so it just really is about... Um, creating opportunities for these and ensuring that these different initiatives are all speaking to each other. Um, just um, on the issue of Afghanistan, it is of course um, an extremely difficult situation and even just um, from SARS perspective, um, within the fall of Kabul, we had about 1,400 applications for assistance. That's twice, within a few weeks, that's twice as many as we received in the entirety of the year before. Um, so it's an extremely difficult um, case. And on that issue of qualifications and PhDs, um, SARS placement program does have very um, particular requirements. Um, usually this is really t to do around with um, need and resources, but um, the protection team is working to um, be a lot more flexible on those types of qualifications, particularly in the context of Afghanistan. Thank you, Denise, for clarification and for providing um, more uh, fruitful, um, very useful information. So maybe we can have a last round of uh, quick replies or final comments. Uh, uh, if you would like to either address uh, one of the questions that was posed uh, or just have a comment on, uh, on the session as a final remark. Uh, Maria. Uh, the final remark, well, um, I think um, what I would like to highlight, I think especially now since uh, in the context of, well, the work with the Inspire Europe team and now with the context of the, the MSCA for, uh, for Ukraine, I just wanted to say that from, I can speak from, from our unit and the work that we really, uh, and I'm sure it's not only uh, applicable to us, but we really do appreciate the feedback that we are getting um, from, well, the colleagues uh, in the Inspire Europe, but also the wider community because the network, uh, you know, of, um, of expertise and work on this is much broader than that and uh, we really take into account what um what we get from from the ground because ultimately this is the the you know the, the feeding into policy uh and the, the policy feedback cycle that we we take as a let's say case a good uh, example of good practice so in this regard uh, i think that uh, whatever comes their way we are our, our ears are open and our eyes are open and we are here to discuss, obviously, bearing in mind that obstacles are there and the certain things will take uh, time, discussion, uh, patience, uh, but that uh, ultimately, uh, I think that the upcoming uh, MSC for Ukraine um, project will be, be a very big lesson to learn for all of us and to see uh, what is feasible, what is not, and then to have, I think, also a very honest discussion at one point about how we can work together uh, further. So this is uh, this is from my side and thank you. Thank you again.
Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much. Slaven, you want to take the floor? So I, won't, I, won't, I won't take too much because I think so much has already been said, but I think we, like I mentioned a couple of times before, I think we're really at the right moment now if we talk about academic freedom. And there is a clear momentum there. Um, Axel has given an overview of different documents where there is a clear reference made to academic freedom. And we see de definitely this momentum to continue to build up. But we also have to use this momentum to overcome some of the difficulties, some of the challenges that were not possible, I think, to overcome in the past. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking of several things uh, that I hope we will be able to make progress on in the future. More concretely, I think we talk often about academic freedom. Um, there, is, there is also a reference in, in the treaties regarding to this, but unfortunately we lack a clear definition of this. There is a definition in the Rome communique, but nevertheless, uh, definitely for the policing purposes, we need a stronger legal basis when we talk about academic freedom. Um, second thing point is that we talk about uh, protecting academic freedom, there's anecdotal evidence, a lot of, and I think Denise already mentioned a lot of worrying numbers uh, in her introductory speech, but what we need, I think this is something definitely we have to focus on the, on the European level, is we need a monitoring mechanism that has been agreed uh, inside the EU and that will monitor protection of academic freedom on a recurrent basis, but that will also identify improvement points. And so we really have data according to metrics that have been commonly agreed. And the third point is that, and while there's a lot of developments already in place, I think this is very good, but it's important that we don't lose track uh, of all of these things and that we also don't get lost between different documents as well because there are initiatives on the EU level, national level, or level of associations, institutions, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think what we will definitely have to improve in the future is how we pull these different documents together and that's why also as part of this year policy agenda number six I was referring to, we also want to set up kind of a one-stop shop that will serve as an inventory for all the uh, documents that can support individuals, we should support organizations and even member states um, when it comes to topics such as academic freedom. So I think quite some work has been done in the past, but it's clear that we have to use this momentum to really make a lot of significant process uh, pro progress in the next uh, months and years. Thank you, Slaven. Um, I think what's uh also here relevant to us, uh, not just the fact that we will be speaking about monitoring mechanisms tomorrow and try to understand how they can be meaningful to the conversation we're having within SAR and SAR Europe and the national sections, but the fact that all these initiatives that have been adopted, uh, uh, we are now trying to make them known also through the students' uh, uh, component of the academic community. Uh, who are maybe not always taken into consideration in the proper manner. So students who are taking part in our legal clinics, in our advocacy seminars, they are becoming aware. They know these uh, documents are there. The framework is in place. Uh, uh, they deserve to have a voice because of the activities that they're doing and they're learning and understanding also as uh, uh, stakeholders in the different dialogues uh, that are uh, being uh, carried out. So uh, we hope to see that in the future and it's, um, it's uh, very promising. And of course, uh, the uh, positive comment made on Inspire Europe, it's great to know that Inspire Europe will have a plus phase and we will be able to collaborate for a, a longer period. So of course, uh, um, you know, the academic community is uh, widely composed uh, and, and we would like to see students uh, in that context as well. A last word from Axel and then we can conclude. Okay, yes, uh, thank you very much. I also would like to, to comment and maybe also provide some, uh, some answers, at least from my side, on, on the first question that, uh, that was raised, how to make uh, the efforts meaningful and uh, how actually to implement it and maybe also and this is uh, from the, the, what uh, what I'm working on uh, at the international level. So um, I think it has been said uh, academic freedom is not uh, only a value of uh, the European Union. Of course, there are like-minded countries with which we have to work, but uh, there are also non-like-minded countries with which to have, we have to dialogue and uh, make clear actually that uh, when our values and principles 
uh, fundamental values and principles, let's say, are not respected, then um, it is harder for us to actually um, uh, continue cooperating um, on sensitive issues, but uh, also uh, uh, in general. So what actually uh, can we do? So we have this multilateral dialogue that will be launched on the 8th of uh, July, right? the Commission, uh, together with member states, we will reach out to our key international partners in research, innovation and higher education in order actually to, to launch this discussion on uh, the wind principles and values on which we have to uh, base our future cooperation. And here uh, was what I was mentioning, uh, this uh, uh, the Marseille Declaration and then this uh, Council conclusions of the 10th of June, um, make uh, uh, provide us with a very strong position from the European Union side on uh, uh, academic freedom. So this is something that we are going to promote uh, and say to our international partners, okay, our cooperation must be based on um, academic freedom and other values. The second point is maybe more technical, but um, I think uh, it is important to um, now, as we have uh, so many strategic documents, as, as has been said uh, by my colleagues, um, we should also uh, write academic freedom and the protection of academic freedom in uh, uh, agreements at international level, for example, in s and agreements where countries agree on, uh, on a framework actually for their cooperation. And here again, academic freedom must be uh, in such agreements in order to ensure that um, uh, our cooperation with uh, third countries is based on on such values and principles and this is not only on 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 the state level but also on the institutional level and here maybe i can come back to to, to the earlier question um, on what is actually uh, um, the university's roles in, in, in this endeavor on protecting uh, academic freedom. Um, also an institutional uh, agreement between your universities and universities in third countries. Please uh, make sure that there is a sufficient um, uh, protection, uh, at least from a juridical point of view, on academic freedom. This is how we can move forward together at uh, each one, of course, on, on the level he or she uh, represents. Uh, but I believe that, especially with the dialogue we are going to launch, uh, we will um, continue the discussion and uh, hopefully uh, provide more protection for academic freedom worldwide. Thank you very much. And that concludes our panel discussion for today. I just want to warmly thank our panelists for joining us and to you all for joining us in, in the room today. Of course, there is much work um, ongoing and much work to be done, but it is, as Slavin said, um, a good moment for academic freedom and um, lots of thoughts to take forward um, as we close out the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So... Thank, thank you very much to the speakers. Uh, um, we hope to have uh, uh, more occasions. And for the audience here, we're reconvening in a half hour. So we have a last uh, session for this afternoon, a session that is dedicated to refugee scholarship and refugee knowledges. So we're coming from the European institutional perspective on academic freedom to the perspective of uh, uh, lived experiences and different subjectivities involved in these uh, issues. Unfortunately, Professor uh, Sandro Paccagnella will not be with us uh, as a chair. He had an accident, so he apologizes and sends his best greetings to the friends, uh, particularly Asle Vatansever and others that he's met before. Uh, I think Paola Molino kindly agreed uh, to be the chair for the next session, so we're reconvening at 4.30. And not streaming. Poi noi raccogliamo tutti e li... Sì. Penso che manderemo alla fine, raccogliamo tutti i materiali, mettiamo tutti in una cartella e poi condividiamo con tutti i partecipanti. I think it... Uh, I mean, I could hear very little. He wanted to turn lower the volume because it was very high on Zoom. So the others... Mm. Uh, I just want to say hello to Denise. I'm upset. Oh, no, I can't believe we, we, we give for granted things are just ongoing. I was actually going to ask you. Oh, sorry.